Hello and welcome, I'm Natalie MacDonald and you are watching Fund Forum Live Chat. We're joining you live on site here at the JW Marriott Hong Kong from day two of Fund Forum Asia 2016. Now over the next 15 minutes, we're going to be bringing you some of the top topics, conversation, discussion points, arguments that came out of the conversation today and they are laughing already. This, <laughs> this chat is I brought know. to you by HSBC and you can follow a lot of the conversations that we're having by looking at the hashtag FFAsia16 on Twitter and Instagram and, and across all other social media streams. So let's introduce my guests for today and we'll hop straight into it. Now, to my right this evening, I have Dan Waters of ICI Global. Dan, thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us today. Delighted. And now I have a, a female joining me for the first time this week <laughs> and it really is very, very <laughs> pleasant to welcome Cheers. Eleanor Wan of BEA Union Investment Management. Eleanor, thank you so much for, for, you. for joining me today. Yeah, but I'm a little bit scared now. It's okay. <laughs> girl, girl power. <laughs> we will get through this. And certainly last but by no means least, we've got John Holzman who of the, U of the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations. So team, welcome to this cheers, final cheers, live chat stream cheers, of the cheers, week. Cheers, cheers. Now, particularly, <laughs> we are concentrating today on, on global forces and, and particularly which global forces will have a disruptive impact on the Asian funds management landscape. Now, and I'm going to, going to come to you first as someone who's obviously you know, regionally based and has been very active and, and present during some of the conversations we've seen this week. What is, what is striking out for you as, as being that disruptive Force. <laughs> well, we have a lot of disruptives uh, in the industry. Not just at this table. <laughs> no, no. They were just highlighting some of the issues. But I think mostly for us is how to grow the business. Um, for our industry, regulation is the most biggest uh, attention that we are on. And then we can only comment that regulation can only be harder and harder. Mm -hmm. I don't think there will be any loosening. Uh, of course, uh, I listened to uh, about the geopolitical um, issues around, and China is also another big topic for us in asset management here. Uh, we invest in Asia, but uh, this year you will see that the sentiment is uh, not as excited as it was before, because I think we are very uncertain what is our future. Uh, a lot of us uh, uh, amongst ourselves and discuss, yes, uh, we will still um, be interested in investing in China, but for how long? I think um, as a business, uh, we invest, but we also want to have some returns. But it seems that now is prolonging this, and so we are a bit um, difficult. Yeah. But on that on that investment space, I mean, something Dan, something that we were discussing was the fact that there's a lot of companies that seem to be kind of in it for for a fun time, not a long time. We're seeing <laughs> we're seeing sort of a, a, a short term strategy versus yeah. that that long term plan. Yeah. And again, that must be creating a lot of a lot of yeah. difficulty as well in terms of momentum moving forwards. Well, it's interesting, Natalie. So today in in the forum, we asked the question, uh, we posed the proposition that bank distribution is leading to systematic churning of client accounts. The way advisors are remunerated is encouraging them to just short term, three months, four months, sell something new, get the commission, sell something new. And of course, we all know that, that in Asia, and not just in Asia, but, but certainly in Asia, fund saving in funds is kind of a, a non sequitur. You save in a bank account. And funds is for something, a little kick, a little bit of a bump, something extra. Um, but actually, when you begin to look at what's ha happening demographically and the way the world is moving, <coughs> countries all over the world are trying to figure out how people can have enough money to save for the long term. So we're, in, we're going to China on Friday to talk about that. We were just in Tokyo talking about that. How do you get to encourage people to save for the long term? Well, you don't do it by changing accounts every three months. That is not the answer. So there's a real, I would say, almost a vicious circle of short-term thinking about what a fund is for and remuneration that is supporting that short-termism. That's a big challenge. It's not just in Asia. It's a global issue, and it's a regulatory but, but issue I globally. Have another take. I, I, I do not want to just put all the problem just on the bank, because I think at the end of the day, the investors need to put a, um, their position into it. Indeed. However, in Asia, which also talked about it in the panel yesterday, was that investors do not know why they would need to invest. Right. It, it's not a neat basis. Mm. So I think um, the Asian investor, yes, we all know they are very, a little bit short term. Um, it's all relative, right? Compared to Europe, the States, yes, they're shorter term in terms of the investment. I think 
we do not create a need base for them. I think this is what we are, the ch most challenging mm. uh, thing that we are in the industry is working on. Right. Well, I think something Dan mentioned is, is we're not looking at this confusion, this, this uncertainty over what the next step is simply just in, in Asia and in the mm. Asian region, but it is, a, it is a global factor. And again, something that's cropped up a lot over the last few days yeah. is the fact that we are in such a unique circumstance, not only if we look at central bank policy, but also you know, market activity itself. Now, John, obviously, we don't have a crystal ball. If we did, we would all be making a lot of money. But why is there that total uncertainty of what the heck comes next? Well, I think I think the problem, certainly geostrategically and in terms of political risk, you know, we have fires, but historically they're manageable. This isn't 1940. The Nazis aren't at the gate of Moscow. Britain is not about to surrender if Lord Halifax is made prime minister. To Hitler, you know, we've had worse moments. The problem is not the fires, it's the lack of firemen. Who are the firemen who are putting these fires out? And that leads to risk. Uh, the United States, preoccupied, politically sclerotic, the Democratic Party moving left of where it's ever been. Look at Bill Clinton's outrage that everything he's done is being repudiated by the mainstream of the party. He used to be for free trade, it used to be for balanced budgets, it used to be for workfare. Now it's all, that's all gone. Um, and the Republican Party moving right of where it's been in memory. Uh, you have no one in the center to actually make the deals that made America the political center of the world, meaning left-wing Republicans like me working with right-wing Democrats to keep containment doctrine going for 60 years. Pretty long and pretty effective policy. That's gone. China, huge question mark, as we said this morning. Uh, China can be a force for good. It can be a disruptive force. The jury is utterly out on whether it's a status quo or revolutionary power in the medium term, three to five year period. Now, we can do things to help make it more a status quo power. For instance, bringing it into TPP would be incredibly helpful to Trans-Pacific Partnership. I want China to do better and better. The more China does well, the more likely it is to rescue us in the next Lehman crisis. <laughs> um, and so I want China involved. Every man is a conservative after dinner, as Emerson said, and I want China to be well fed. Yes. But it's an open question as to whether that happens. Europe off the chart, isolationist, self-involved, growing at zero. So of the three, uh, Japan, tr tremendous problems with abenomics. And, and can the third arrow, which is what matters, structural reform work or not? Um, for all the smoke and mirrors, that's the question. So we have, we have huge question marks about all the firemen at the same time. So the fires are utterly manageable, but let's put it this way, I run a political risk company and business is booming. Well, I would, uh, to, to continue this, to continue this, to continue this, 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 by a metaphor, I mean, as you mentioned, we have <laughs> play on. We have we have you know U.S. election. We have we mentioned prior to this you know Brexit. We've also got in Europe negative interest rates. We've got China and the, and the general Asia region through this whole deregulating idea and 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 how that is going to go. Australia, we just have a have a budget coming up. Just not mm. really too too much going on there. Um, how, how long are these fires going to burn? Particularly if we have no firefighters to put them out. Dan, where, yeah. where, are, you, where are you seeing future? Well, I don't think I'm gonna make comments on the political um, uh, firefighting capabilities of any country, actually. It's a, very, it's a very challenging time in the world. And yes, is China too big to fail? Yes. Are there issues in, in Europe? Yes. Is Brexit a massive decision-making point? Yes. Is the situation in the U.S. Uh, unique in its history? Probably yes. All those things are true. But in the meantime, we're, we're in the business of asset management. We're in the business of trying to help our investors plan for their future and live, you know, be able to live in a meaningful and a uh, sustainable manner for the future. And that's what we're talking about today. And one of the things that we, that, that we touched on, that's, this, is, this is a disruptive force in the most negative kind of way, is cybercrime. Mm. Absolutely. And cybercrime, I tell you, the, the, the asset managers, targets, they are targets. So much information, yep. so much wealth, yep. so much value. Yep. So one of the things that we've been doing as a global fund association is trying to build a global dialogue about what are good practices in asset management. How do you protect yourself? And not only the good practices, but also build networks so people can talk to each other have confidence, have, have, have confidential relationships, relationships of trust where they can pick up the phone and say, you know, this is happening right now. And you want, might want to look out for it. This is the way it's coming into your system. Yep. It hit us, and then this is what we're doing. Yep. Build those networks of cooperation and build cooperation with the national police authorities so that if you have a problem, you're not cold calling the local police to yeah. say, oh, I have this problem. You're calling somebody you know. 
Here, let me jump in on that because I think it's interesting. I, I have the reasonable security clearance in the states, and let me let, let me say that the one issue, and I've been to briefing after briefing, that people say we don't have the capability up to what's going on. The new instances of power are cyber, yeah. and second, the Treasury. Under Obama, the Treasury Department has become nobody planned this, but it's become the force in foreign affairs because we realized that America mm. had more global heft over SWIFT, for instance. With Iran, you can bring Iran to its knees by just excluding anybody who does business through SWIFT. Why? Yeah. Would you rather do business with the United States or Tehran? Obviously the United States. China, dragging its feet, decided obviously America was a better bet. And the minute the Chinese did, that meant Iran would come to the table. And sure enough, they did. That's a good side of it. The bad side, as you say, is cyber. If you're cold calling the policemen, as you rightly say, if there aren't those relationships that are built, which is the challenge, mm. you can't get it done. And so one of the things that has to happen is greater coordination between business, between government, which live in totally different worlds. I mean, I live in both of them. And frankly, half of the efficacy I provide is translation <coughs> between the two worlds. They don't understand each other. They don't live in the same time frame. They don't have the same pressures. Doing that is a huge challenge. But if it can be surmounted, I think can be actually an opportunity. I think you're right. Hmm. I mean, I'm one of these very, very simple people that has the same three passwords <laughs> across, Me too. across, across uh, all no, no, the no, name no, of no, my no. dog. All technology, yeah. exactly, yeah. or your first. Don't first. record that. Mother's media name, all, all that kind of thing. But again, but we've got to look at. Oh my God, I've been found out. <laughs> but we need to look at scale, uh, scalability as well, because I mean, the the, the boundaries for for cyber security and, and infringements of cyber security mm. are phenomenal. So I mean, do we have um, um, not only that, but but resources and investment, and and people really actually taking it seriously and, and understanding the, the the scalability that needs to be in place for this? I think so. I mean, I think what you see in asset management certainly this isn't something that people have just started worrying about like this week. This has been going on for a very long time. What I think is new is beginning to try to build networks of collaboration, cooperation, information sharing at global level because this is this is this is by this is it by definition cross border. This is all about how you do stuff to people from far away and don't get caught. So building relationships, it's happening at regulatory level between the police authorities, the regulatory bodies, but also at business level, as I was saying before, and then between those levels, yes. Is there some translation issues? Yes. Do you need to build those relationships? Indeed. You do. And building relationships of trust in something like this with a regulator or a police policeman, you know, it's a little scary at first because you think, do I really want to tell these people this? Sure. And if I do, what will they do to me? Yeah. And I think it's th that... that the recognition, I think, is beginning to be there. This is such a serious threat and a big problem. We've just got to trust each other and get on with it. Well, you're hitting the key point, which is psychological, which is these are people who are trained, by definition, to not share secrets. That's yep. their job, yep. and they're very good at it. And now saying to them, you got to share secrets. Now, intellectually, they may agree with us, but emotionally, they didn't get where they got by doing that. So it mm -hmm. takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes effort to get to know them. I mean, for all the email talk and all the Skype talk, sitting down with someone over a coffee, a drink, a meal, and doing that regularly sounds boring. Let me say one of the things that happened with Lehman and with China, one of the great advantages is the Obama administration actually have a non-European touchstone. It's difficult with Europe. Mm. He doesn't have skin in the game with Europe, unlike any American president since 1945. He doesn't care. He didn't go to school there like Clinton. He wasn't a Rhodes Scholar. That's not what he did. But he did understand Indonesia from his childhood. He did understand emerging markets. And so when the day came, he could talk to the Chinese in a much more comfortable way than, say, any other American president <laughs> since him because he bothered having a meal with them. Mm. Well, like you say, it is. It's all going to take a sit down. It's, it's going to take plenty of wine on, on everyone's part, guys. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I am going to. Say, I'm going to. Thanks for thanks for plumping the wine. I'm going to call uh, today's panel to a close, mainly because I feel like John needs to go and change all of his passwords now. Across <laughs> all the settings. Dan, Eleanor, John, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and joining us for this live stream on this final day two of Fund Forums Asia 2016. I'm Natalie McDonald. Many thanks for your company. We'll see you very, very soon. Goodbye.